Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Let's talk about a few of the things that are coming up. There's quite a bit, actually. Today, after worship, we've got Youth Group and Presby Kids Club. Um, we're going to have lunch first, and then we're going to head over to the Twin Oaks Corn Maze. That's going to be a lot of fun. Then the session hosting that stewardship dinner at the end of this month, October 28th at 6 p.m. I hope to see you there. Then uh, in the next few days or in the next week, you should be getting in the mail your pledge cards for next year. Um, and don't think about that as bad news, I hope. Um, it, it's not a bill. It's just a way for the church to get some sense of, of its budget for the next year so that we can be wise. We can be good planners and we can be responsible with the money so that we kind of know what we're going to have and how we can plan our budget. So it's really, the pledge cards are really about communication and, and our good judgment as a church of the money, to use the money as well as we can. So please pray about those pledge cards. Um, decide to the best of your ability. We know that life is uncertain and things may change, but make your best guess. And we are going to turn in those pledge cards Sunday, October 29th, here in worship, and we'll have a special prayer of dedication to offer those gifts up to God and ask God to bless them. So please consider that and bring them on the 29th. Then nominating committee will meet next Sunday, October 22nd, after worship in the fireside room. They're looking for the next leaders. They're going to help guide this church in the next year. Um, Parish Sunday, this is a new thing that we're trying. Parish Sunday is next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be a good day to come. Don't miss next Sunday. After worship in the fellowship hall, every deacon is going to have a table set up. There will be directories in the back of the church. You can look up what parish you're in, and you can look up who is your deacon, and then go next door and meet your deacon. Have a conversation with them, say hello, and they'll have special treats for you to eat, too, at that table to entice you <laughs> to come see them. So come next Sunday, meet your deacon. Lastly, next Sunday, we're going to have hymn sing Sunday. Um, this is going to be fun. Do you ever want, like, I wonder, I think you can tell a lot about a person by whatever their favorite song is. Like, I wonder what Kathy Matson's favorite hymn is. I wonder what Rita's favorite hymn is, or Ryan's. I think you could learn a lot about a person by knowing what their favorite worship hymn is. So next Sunday, you have a chance to request whatever your favorite hymn is, and you also get to find out what the other people around you really like, what really speaks to them. So I'm excited. I think, I'm hoping this is going to be a lot of fun. There's still going to be a prayer, still going to be a short message, but it's going to be a different kind of service where you can request your favorite songs. And I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Let's stand and greet each other with a friendly welcome.
Good morning. If I could have your attention, we'll continue with our worship service. All those that are able, I would ask that you would stand and join with me in the call to worship, which is from God's Word. O come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving and ringing the joyful tongues and praise. You may be seated, and I'd like to have all the children come forward for the children's message. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. How are you this morning? Good? How are you, Carter? You doing good over there? Uh, Asher has allergies. Ash, your brother has allergies? No, Aw. Asher does. Well, yeah, that's Carter's brother. He has allergies. That's too bad. I hope he feels better, don't you? Yeah. We could pray for him to feel better. Um, That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Can I tell you something? Sure. This was a long time ago. So, I was fishing. We are, we are at Brownie in all the junk and everyone threw and and and, and we found a stack of 
want her catfish too. Wow, that's and I awesome. One. Good for you. Hi, yeah. congratulations. And we ate him. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, you're pretty. You're a good fisherman. You're better than better than I ever was. You know, that's what I want to talk about today. Did you know that one day a long time ago, I was your age? Uh -huh. What do you think I was like when I was your age? I was. I wasn't a very good fisherman at all. I didn't even know how to fish. I still don't. Um, did you know that your mom and dad, they used to be young like you? Yeah. It's pretty interesting. And you know that someday you might have little children like yourself. No. That's I'm pretty weird to think dad about. dad in the family. And my mom is going to be the grandma when I grow up. That's right. Your dad will be a grandpa and your mom will be a grandma. And I'm going to be the dad. Yeah, you will. You will. Yeah, that's right. Little boys grow up to be dads, and little girls grow up to be moms. Turn into a mom. That's right. Well, <laughs> well, that is what we're going to talk about today in church. How important it is to think about those future children when we will become moms and dads, and maybe even grandmas and grandpas. So let's pray and thank God for that. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful children and that, that they will grow up and they will have children. And Lord, we pray that all that you've taught us, everything in your word, will pass on to these children and to their children. Lord, help us to do what it takes to make sure that that happens. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. We have got a minute for mission from, yeah, from Willard. Thanks, Willard. Good morning. Um, today is the 30th year of crop walk in Canyon County. And I tell this every year, I'm, I was involved in the first one and it used to be a 10 kilometer walk and I pulled my five year old kid a lot of the way in a wagon, and my friend that also did it, that's um, involved in the crop walk with Trinity Lutheran, reminds me that there was a snow shower that we walked through. I, I don't remember that, but I remember pulling the wagon through a gravel road, which with the kid in it wasn't a whole lot of fun. But um, anyway, in those 30 years, um, We've raised over a half a million dollars to help fight hunger here in Canyon County. And um, let me see what else do I want to tell you. This year, um, every year, part of the money goes to various um, projects overseas, and part of the money stays here. Um, there's little cards like this that I've put on all of the tables when you go to have coffee, cookies, and such. So if you would um, take time to just read the card that's at the table, you'll find out something. They're all different. If you're, if you're real curious, go and read them all. Um, there's also the bulletin insert. And um, this year, the local recipients, the, the local board here in Canyon County decides where it goes, and it goes somewhere different every year. This year, it's going to the Trinity Church Garden and they give food to needy people as individuals, but for the most part, the food that they harvest from their garden goes and supports the Salvation Army um, and also the um, rescue mission and that type of thing. The, the other recipient, there's always two, is the Middleton Food Bank. So like I said, this church has been involved in it, I, I don't think every single year, but we didn't miss very many in the last 30 years, in the last 10 or 15, I don't think we've missed at all. But anyway, I'll be sitting in the back. If anybody wants to join me in the walk, it's at 2.30, it's in Caldwell this year, it's um, at the College of Idaho, and they will start from the student union, which Lyle told me last week, I didn't realize was the old gymnasium from when I went there. Um, but anyway, the registration is at 2, the walk is at 2.30, and I'll be sitting in the back and set up a little table if anybody would be willing to um, 
donate to help support this cause, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Willard. If you would, join me in the call to worship, call to confession, excuse me. God sees into our hearts, therefore let us worship without any pretense of our own righteousness, but bringing to God our authentic selves, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God, we confess that we have been abundantly blessed, yet have said to ourselves, my power and my strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. We have turned our jobs, our investments, our money in false gods. We have trusted in them more than in you. Our worldly storehouses are large, but our treasures in heaven is too small. Forgive us and help us to be wise with the wealth we have been giving. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. I ask you to please join with me in a time of prayer, and we'll conclude by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the world, and in it we see your grace. We see it in nature. We see it in parents and children. We see it in the love that people show to one another around us. Lord, make us grateful for your love in all of its forms, in creation, in your word, and in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. Lord, we pray that all that we do, our entire lives, would be a way of saying thank you in word and in deed to you for all that you've given. Lord, help us to respond to your grace by acting in obedience to your word and to your will, to being the kind of people that you want us to be the kind of people who follow Jesus in his love, in his forgiveness, in his compassion, in his commitment to justice and to the truth. Lord, make us all more like Jesus. We lift up to you now those among us who are in need of compassion. We pray for all those who are sick and lonely and hungry. Lord, be with them and bless them. We pray for the people of Las Vegas who are still recovering and grieving from a terrible tragedy. Lord, we pray for continued healing for Marianne Huter, who's at Karcher Rehab. Bless her and help her to get better and stronger. Lord, we pray for Jan Park, who is showing signs of dementia. We ask that you'd bless her with comfort and her family with wisdom and peace. We pray, Lord, for Naomi Field, uh, whose husband Rick is in St. Luke's in the last stages of ALS. Lord, we pray for her as she, as she goes through this difficult time and deals with the grief and the loss. Lord, we pray for all of our snowbird friends and neighbors, um, specifically, especially Jean Agnew, as they head to wherever they're going, to warmer climates. Lord, bless them with safe travels, and may they enjoy the winter. Lord, we lift up to you all these prayers in the name of Jesus, and we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning again. We're talking about stewardship, in case you haven't noticed this month. We talked about membership the first Sunday. We talked about gratitude last Sunday. Today we're going to talk about the future and the key to the future. And it's in this scripture from Deuteronomy. And this sermon will have, it'll have two parts. There'll be this part uh, that, that I'll give, and then we'll take the offering, and then we'll have the second part of the sermon which will be a video, and that will be the best part, trust me. But listen here to the word of the Lord as God speaks to us about the future. If you will only heed his every commandment that I am commanding you today, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and with all your soul, then he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, and you will gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil, and he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you will eat your fill. Take care, or you will be seduced into turning away, serving other gods, and worshiping them. For then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit. Then you will perish quickly, off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall put these words of mine in your heart and soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children 
may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Sarah has a large family. Some of you know this. Some of you also know that she's Indian. Her, she was born here, Sarah was, but her parents were born in India. And her parents, along with many of her aunts and uncles and cousins, they immigrated here to this country. Um, and it's, again, a large family. They all married. We get together a lot. And there's a running joke among all of us cousins, we call ourselves, who married into this Indian family. And, and there's people of all different races. There's half Jewish people like me. There's African Americans, Mexicans, Philippines. There's every nationality. And all of us have a joke that we, we married into free tech support. <laughs> I can get away with that because Sarah knows I love her. But, uh, but yeah, companies... Companies outsource their tech support in large part to India because they have some expertise there and and because labor costs are lower. But tech support is not the only thing that we've outsourced. We've also outsourced the moral and spiritual upbringing of our children. And I'm generalizing here because some, some parents still do a lot of this at home. Um, so it's a generalization. I'm generalizing, not universalizing. But uh, it started out as a good thing. It started with public education. If you go back far enough, everybody taught their own children everything at home. Or they hired a tutor at home to do it. But public schools came around, which is a good thing. So every citizen would know how to read, how to write, how to think critically. It's pretty important if you live in a democracy that every citizen can do that, whether their parents are able or not. But we started extending it. I don't know exactly now how this happened, but we started extending it and expecting more and more from public schools. Not just to teach them to read and write and think critically, but to have morals, to believe certain things, to have values. I think that may have been a mistake. We've expected so much. You know, we're mad now that they took prayer out of schools or they don't talk about God in school or they took under God out of the pledge. We're upset about all those things or they took the Ten Commandments out of school. But why do we ever expect that from public school in the first place? Why do we ever make it their job to teach our kids anything about God? Instead of regretting and being upset that they've taken those things out, we should regret and be upset that we ever put the responsibility on them in the first place. It's our job to teach religion morality and values to children. Our job as parents and our job as a church. And we should never have outsourced that responsibility anywhere else. We've also outsourced the spiritual moral upbringing of our children onto other things. First it was radio, then it was television and media, and now it's the internet. And through the internet to the children of other parents. They teach our children values. I'll never forget, shortly after Sarah and I were married and, and before we had kids, we were driving in a car as a family to the zoo, and my nephew, five years old, got into this argument with his grandma and grandpa and some of his other aunts and uncles. And he had this friend at school, and I don't remember, I think his name was Fernando or something, but this kid at school had told him something and his parents, every adult in his family in the car was telling him, yeah, I don't think Fernando's right about that. And my little nephew George was convinced that Fernando was a genius. Fernando knew better than his parents, than his grandparents, than every adult in that car. And I remember being kind of mildly amused hearing my five-year-old nephew think that his five-year-old friend was a higher authority than the other adults in his family. 
I don't think it's funny anymore now that I have kids. It's kind of scary. But yeah, we've outsourced the upbringing of our children, spiritual and moral, onto schools, onto technology, TV, and their friends. And there's a few reasons for this. Go ahead to the next slide. There's a couple reasons. The first is that parents don't have enough time. It takes a lot of time to teach children about God and about right and wrong, about spiritual values. And parents now, most of them both working, some of them working longer hours for less pay, and there's just not as much time. The second reason is technology. Not only that technology has given them access to other information from their friends, but also how entertaining technology is. At our children's fingertips is any song, any video, any content that they could ever want to see, they can have in a second. So how can we compete with that? When you talk to young people, you have to be more entertaining than their cell phone. And that's a high bar. The third reason is that some parents don't feel like they have enough knowledge. And this isn't a, a knock or criticism. I don't even have enough knowledge. I just taught confirmation. We just finished our last confirmation class with our young students. And they asked some amazingly hard questions. They asked questions that I had a hard time answering, many of which I couldn't fully answer in the short six weeks that we had together. Kids today, say what you will about them, but they have, they see through BS. They see through nonsense and they won't accept anything that's not genuine. And anything you teach them, they can go Google and find somebody else's perspective. So you could give them the Christian perspective, but they can find the atheist perspective or the Buddhist perspective or the Jehovah's Witness perspective or the Catholic perspective. So anything that we teach our children is going to be subjected to some pretty rigorous scrutiny. So we have to make sure that what we teach them will stand up to all that other information, all those other perspectives that they have access to. They asked some hard questions. One of the questions they asked, for example, was if there's only one God, why are there so many different religions? Now, it would take... It would take years, and we wouldn't, no one fully knows the answer to that question. It would take years, not just six weeks of confirmation, but years to help them understand that question and to work through all the possible answers. Years that parents and even I can't spend, and that is why we want to hire a director of youth and children's ministry, someone who will have that time someone that will use technology and use creativity to speak to them in ways that they can hear, to spend the time that needs to be spent so that they can understand their own faith for themselves. It's so important to do this. Life is shaped like a cross. Next slide. Life has a cruciform shape. Christian life. We live lives on two planes in the shape of a cross. The horizontal plane is the relationships we have with our friends, with our neighbors, with our family members on the one side and with the world on the other. Our relationships with all the people that God brings us, with the world itself. And Christ calls us to open our arms to love and to care about all those people and all those things. That is the horizontal plane of existence, the one most of us see, touch, and hear every day. But there's a second plane, a vertical plane of existence. And this is made up of all the people that we'll never meet, the people who we can't meet because they're long dead and gone or because they haven't been born yet. These are the relationships with the people, on the one hand, that came before us, on whose shoulders we're standing, who left us a legacy of values, beliefs, and inventions. We're here because of them, though we'll never meet them. We believe what we believe because of them, but we'll never meet them. 
And on the other side of that vertical plane at the top are all those people who will come after us, who we've never met and will never meet. They will live their lives on our shoulders. We will leave them a legacy. We have to leave them a legacy. There's a story that reminds us that there is this vertical plane of existence because we forget it. We forget to live our lives on two planes, the horizontal and the vertical. Story, a mother bird had three chicks. This mother bird took her first chick, carried the chick over a stream. As the mother bird was flying, she took her young chick under her arm and she said, tell me, my child, when I am old, will you carry me under your wing the way I am carrying you? And the little chick said, of course, mother. What a, what a silly question. The mother said, ah, you're lying. And she let the chick slip into the water. The mother went back for the second chick, carried, her over, carried that chick over the stream and said, tell me, my child, when I'm old, will you carry me under your wing the way I am carrying you now? And the little chick said, of course, mother. What a silly question. And at that, the mother said, ah, you're lying. And she let that chick slip into the water. She went back for the, ch the third and last chick, took the chick under her wing, carried her across the stream and said, ah, my child, tell me when I'm old, will you carry me under your wing the way I am carrying you now? And that little chick said, no, mother, for by then I will have chicks of my own. And the mother said, ah, oh, my child, you're the one who tells the truth. And she took that chick to the other side of the stream. We live a cross-shaped existence, but we forget. We forget about that vertical plane, about all those who came before us and all those who, came, who will come after us. They are important. Lastly, we also have two afterlives. There are two afterlives. Did you know that? Not just one afterlife, but two. There's the afterlife, our afterlife, the life we hope to live with God in heaven after we die. But there's also a second afterlife, which is the life that comes after us here. That will happen too. There will be a life after we're gone. The question we're asking this month is, will we leave a legacy in the life that comes after us? Will we leave a legacy for the vertical plane of our existence and not just focus on the horizontal plane? Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us, for the hope of our afterlife and the hope of the life that comes after us. Lord, may we leave a legacy. May we be grateful for the legacy that has been given to us. May we pass it on to the next generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
If your time be with worth saving. Well, good morning. Good morning, morning Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming in. I'm, I'm interested in talking with both of you about the church and about stewardship, but let's start by going back and just tell us a little bit about your upbringing in the church. How did the church, I know the church influenced both of you growing up. What was that like? Well, um, I recall going to Sunday school um, rather early on, um, probably in the five or six years old, and decided that, uh, that I just loved the idea of a God that looked after me all the time. And so I had this great imaginary friend of God that was with me always. And somehow or another, that, had, that sort of bore fruit through my life. I have, have always felt the presence of God. And so um, the natural consequence was to, to seek it in church and in Sunday school. How about you, Red? Well, mine was a little unusual. I was the son of four children of a Baptist pastor. And when I, most of my growing up was in Fort Worth. He was a pastor of the second largest Baptist church in Texas. So going to church and being involved was not really a choice. <laughs> you, you were there all the time. I remember my father, as I look back on it and listen to other preachers, and this is not a criticism of anybody, but he was a very good minister. He, he was always well prepared. He was well read. Couldn't do it from memory like you did. He always had a little notebook. But uh, I was, an, I, as an adult and later in life, particularly, was impressed by uh, his dedication. Well, we are hoping to raise enough money this year to hire a children's pastor and youth director. Um, were there any special people? I mean, you mentioned your father were there, and your mother. Were there any certain? Sunday school teachers, pastors, yeah, role models that you haven't mentioned that really shaped your faith when you were young. I remember one in particular. Um, I was in junior high, I think, at this time, and we were. I was attending a startup church that was that was rather close to our house, and uh, <clears throat> so it was it was a small church, and I think there probably were three junior high age kids and. Um, and every Sunday, this, uh, I, I didn't think of him as a young man then, but he probably was a young man, showed up um, faithfully and talked. Usually, he and I were the only ones who were there. And, but well, that someone would, would, sh would show up prepared mm -hmm. just for you mm -hmm. must have made you feel like you were really did. It was It impressed me even as a... And the cow youth. <laughs> I think it's extremely important for us as a church and church family to provide some leadership for the youth. Not that they're not getting some leadership from adults, but uh, to show them, emphasize that they are important, like Sal reflected. And I think there's a great um, longing um, for people to find a place to belong and they keep chasing these um, ephemeral um, pursuits in order to find a spiritual groundedness that uh, um, that I found in the church, and I think they could too. I can remember when our children um, rebelled, oh, do we have to go to church? And I said, yes, it's, it's a part of your education. You have to go to school, and you have to go to church if you live in this family because we feel like it's important. Yeah, I, uh, I would agree with all of that. I think we need to provide for the youth, but selfishly, I hope my church family stays intact for my support. We're, we're in the twilight zone, and that's. <laughs> I, I hope they'll be here so I can lean on. Well, this month we're talking about stewardship. That's a big word. Um, what are your thoughts on that word? What does that word mean to you? Well, I think it means participating financially 
and with my talents and anything I can do. Serving as an officer, an elder in particular, <clears throat> you, uh, you begin to realize how, how much or how expensive it is to run a church and have the, the kind of personnel and uh, clientele and the comfortable, safe building that's, that's necessary in order to, to, to put on the kind of programs that we aspire to. And, and that, um, that certainly reinforces your thinking about how much you give. Um, and uh, Rodney and I both worked on stewardship campaigns and, and, and realized that um, <clears throat> that it's not always the amount that a person gives, but the spirit in which they give it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty darn important. Um, and, uh, and the Lord just does seem to provide when you step out there and, and give sacrificially of your time or talent or whatever. It's just amazing how the, that void is filled. That's interesting. Could you say, I'm curious about that. What do you mean by that? Well, I, it's kind of the... A supply. The more you give, the more seems to be given to you. Um, I and I'm. I think money in particular. It it probably we probably didn't get around to getting close to tithing till after our children go left home, and we felt like um, it was uh, that that money wasn't quite so um, so dear, and that we. At the, that stage in life, that we could we could begin to work toward tithing, and 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 we did um, eventually. And and once we did that, it was it was interesting because the needs the needs were filled. Um, we never felt the lack of that money that we gave to the church. It pretty much came off the top, and and. And more came in its place in some way or another. Um, I knew a woman once in this church that said that told me once that she had very little to give money-wise. She was a single mom, and uh, um, but she had a good voice, and she said I felt like that was something I could give to my church. And so she was very active in choir and, and special. So there are, there are many ways to give. Yeah. And I feel like <clears throat> we can cover, like that we can cover for those who don't have mm -hmm. what we have. Yeah. I can't sing. No. So I'm glad there's <laughs> people here to cover over my lack of <laughs> talent in that area. And there may be some who have more to give, and they can cover for those who, at whatever point in their life right now, may not have much to give. And when you get older and your talents begin to diminish, then money is what you have more of. <laughs> you know, by saying they probably pay me a great deal of money to do it again. Yeah. Uh, in my case, at least, I have belonged to, uh, or still belong to, maybe a half a dozen different organizations, some professional related, others not. But I always felt like if I was going to join in and participate in a certain one of those, like a, a civic club, for instance, um, that opportunity was given to me because somebody before me came and supported it, both financially and in other ways. And I, I, f I feel the same way, not only about the church, but any organization that I join. The church is certainly... Um had its problems and continues to have its problems and always will have its problems probably until the end of time. Um, but it is still the very best vessel to carry this seed of, of love and knowledge of God. Um, and, and I just feel like it's, uh, it's privileged to, to help perpetuate that to help keep this little building here going. It's just a small part, but it's it's my part. It's something I can do. I think it's important for the, this church and maybe the church at large to listen to the people and provide 
what they want in not only in worship but programs and growth and that sort of thing. And again, it takes money and time and talents, and that's that's what it's going to require to grow. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, Rodney and Sally, for coming. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with me and with the congregation. Thank you for asking, Aaron. Thanks for asking. Nice to be a part of this. God bless. Have a good one. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Karen. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. For the times they are Please hear the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.